Now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thanks, Speaker. My, uh, my question uh, to the Premier. Premier, um, in review of your uh, first year in office, I noticed that Ontario didn't create a single new job, that we lost uh, as many jobs in the province as we gained. And unfortunately, uh, Dalton McGuinty's approach and Premier Wynne's approach continue to put on the wrong track. We're losing jobs, 39,000 in December alone, and people are losing hope in the province. So my question to you is, given that Ontario did not add a single new job in all of 2013, why do you want to do more of the same? Isn't it time to try a new and different track to put people back to work and Ontario back in business? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, you see it, please. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, well, first of all, let me just uh, welcome everyone back, and I want to just say to uh, the MPPs elect, uh, Wayne Gates and uh, Gila Marteau, um, congratulations to them, and uh, we look forward to welcoming them in the legislature. And let me just say to uh, the leader of the opposition, Mr. Speaker, through you, that in fact he's got his. He's got his information wrong. Yeah, there have been 93,000 net always. new jobs created in this province, Mr. Speaker, just in the last year. Last month, there were 23,000 new jobs, 6,000 net new jobs. So, in fact, Mr. Speaker, the plan that we have in place is working, Mr. Speaker, and that plan is based on investing in infrastructure. It's based on making sure that people have the skills that they need and investing in people so that they can get the training and the skills that they need. And it's based on working in partnership with business, Mr. Speaker. Thank I you. hope the Leader of the Opposition can work with us on that. Thank you, Supplementary. <clears throat> you, you know, there's the um, old expression, Premier, the facts are stubborn things. Uh, throughout all of 2013, Ontario did not add a single uh, net new job in the province. We lost as many jobs uh, as we gained, and that, that's a record of failure. And I know you try to brush it off on the McGuinty administration like you had once met Dalton McGuinty at a fundraiser or something, even though you're one of the key ministers. Um, you've continued on the same path, and that means that we have almost a million people uh, in our province who are out of work. I think we do a lot better than that. The second thing that concerns me is not only under your uh, premiership have we not had new jobs in 2013. Um, we now are the only province in Canada that saw welfare rates uh, increase. Shame. The number of people stuck on dependency. Ontario was unique, sadly, in this fact that our proportion has actually increased. To me, this seems to be a, a record of failure. Uh, I think we can restore hope to Ontario and put people back to work, but we can't do it the same way. So why are you stuck on the McGuinty agenda? Isn't it time Thank to you. try something new? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I understand that uh, the, we're at the beginning of a new session and that the leader of the, uh, the opposition is going to go on the attack. I get that, Mr. Speaker. But I think it's really important that the leader of the opposition be accurate when Order. he goes on that attack, Mr. Speaker. There have been 95,000 net new jobs created in this province just in the last year, Mr. Speaker. So he's just plain wrong when he uh, he puts out that there are no new jobs. It's just not true. So I look forward to debating with him the issues, Mr. Speaker, but I want to debate with him on a factual basis. So 95,000 net new jobs. And if the Leader of the Opposition is asking whether we will join him on a spiral downward, Mr. Speaker, to lose good-paying jobs in this province and undermine labour, Mr. Speaker, and his so-called right to work, we're not going there. There, Mr. Speaker. You see it, please. You see it, please. Final. The member from Eglinton Lawrence, come to order. Final supplementary, please. Well, well, Premier, that's my entire point. Uh, the PC caucus is not going to join you on this whirlwind downwards of job losses in the province of Ontario. It's an entire whirlpool. I, I, I guess you're trying to put your first year in office into the past. 
but you say there are more jobs. Tell that the folks that lost their jobs at Kellogg's. Tell that the folks that lost their jobs at Heinz. Tell that the folks who lost their jobs at Novartis. I've got a plan to restore hope to Ontario with more paychecks and better take-home pay. I've got a plan to put young people back to work in the province of Ontario, not in Saskatchewan or Alberta. I call it my million jobs plan. A million new jobs in the next eight years. Million jobs like we did between the plan will lower taxes to create jobs, make energy more affordable, less provincial debt, and emphasis on skilled trades. I've got a plan to create a million jobs in this province. You've got a plan for a whirlpool of job losses. We reject your plan. We see a better future for Ontarians. Won't you join us and support our million job plan today? Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Order. Order. Three times the number of Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, in 2013, employment rose by 95,700 jobs. Since June of 2009, 440,000 net new jobs have been created in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. So, those are the facts. If the leader of the opposition is not interested in those facts, that's his prerogative. But we know, Mr. Speaker, that making those investments in people and partnering with business and making sure that we create the environment for business to come to the province, that that's working, Mr. Speaker. And the drive to the bottom is being led by the Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Speaker. His plan is to cut and slash, to undermine labour, to drive good wage jobs out of the province, Mr. Speaker. The so-called right to work thrust is his, Mr. Speaker. We are not going to go there. We are not going to join him in that Answer. downward spiral. We are going to continue to work with business, create partnerships and create jobs, Mr. Speaker. Leader, leader of the opposition. You, you know, it's a, it's unfortunate. Back to the uh, premier, speaker. It's unfortunate that um, the premier's only plan seems to be the minimum wage act. Our plan is a million jobs plan for good middle class jobs. People can build a career. I want to see people that have jobs that can build a career around. They can buy a house. They can raise a family. Not a job that we're stuck with. And premier, I'll, I'll remind you of your record. You told people of Ontario that your Green Energy Act would create 50,000 jobs. In fact, we found out that it has cost us jobs. Premier, you told us that your big stimulus package in 2008 would create 400,000 jobs. In fact, we've lost jobs in 2013. And you told us that your HST tax hike would create 600,000 jobs. That's over a million jobs. Unfortunately, it probably cost us jobs because there's a million people in Ontario Question. that have no job to go to today. So, Premier, why do you persist in a minimum wage jobs plan? Why don't you engage in our plan to create good middle class jobs and million of them in the next eight years? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, the Right to Work uh, initiative that the Leader of the Opposition uh, would like to initiate would like to see everyone working at minimum wage and lower, Mr. Speaker. That's where he would like to go. So, 440,000 net new jobs in this province since June 2009, Mr. Speaker. And there are many, many people who look at Ontario and know that things are going well, Mr. Speaker. Things are looking much better in Ontario than they were in the Ontario economy Order. starting to grow again. And who said that, Mr. Mr. Speaker, Jim Flaherty, Jan January 5, 2014. Mr. Speaker, the fact is, the fact is, Mr. Speaker, that we have we have worked with industry. We have created opportunity. 440,000 net new jobs have been created in this province. What the leader of the opposition would like to do, Mr. Speaker, is cut services, slash programs, Mr. Speaker, and drive good jobs out of this province. We're not going there. <laughs> well, well, Premier, if I wanted people to work at minimum wage jobs, I'd prop you up just like the NDP is doing, because you're leading when it comes to a job. <laughs> Look, I, I'm not going to argue with you, Premier. If you want a Premier focus on minimum wage jobs, you got one right now. If you want one focused on creating middle-class jobs with better take-home pay, that's me, that's my team, and that's my plan.
Premier, you, you just can't argue with the facts. You failed to create any new jobs in 2013. You, you've turned Ontario now into the welfare capital of Canada. I think we can do a lot better than that. I see an Ontario that rises again. I see an Ontario that guarantees the next generation that they can make their way in the province of Ontario with good careers and good jobs. I've got a plan to do so. It's a million jobs plan. I've asked to meet with you Thank to discuss you. it. The Premier, when we're hemorrhaging jobs in the province, why don't you take another call? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you please? Seated, please. Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, the, the Leader of the Opposition has a slogan, and I understand it's a catchy slogan, Mr. Speaker, well, Peter, but there's no slogan, detail Peter. about how those jobs would actually be created. And in fact, I think Grant LaFleche of the Welland Tribune says it well, Hudak's magical wish thinking is just insulting to our collective intelligence. Oh. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, there's no substance to what the Leader of the Opposition is talking about. And in fact, the specifics that are in the Leader of the Opposition's plan are specifics that would drive us down, Mr. Speaker, that would undermine the gains that, uh, that organized labour has made for generations, Mr. Speaker, would drive good jobs out of the province, and we are not going to go there, Mr. Speaker. We are going to continue to make the investments that are necessary. Right now, business needs a government to partner with them and make sure that they have the supports that are necessary so they can Answer. compete in the global economy. Economy. That's the path that we're going to take, Mr. Speaker. You know, you know, Premier, you were, um, I think we are, we'll agree on this. So you're basically Dalton McGuinty's, one of his top lieutenants. You supported his policies that got us into a huge mess that doubled our debt and lost us 300,000 manufacturing jobs. Now, for the year you've been in office, you've actually made matters worse. We've seen manufacturing jobs losses accelerate in our great province. I, I don't understand why, if you are trying to stick to a plan that's costing us jobs, why you keep putting your head against the wall? Why don't we turn around and try a brand new plan for the province? You want details? Here are the details. Stop the unaffordable subsidies to wind and solar to make hydro affordable. Lower taxes in our province. Say we can do more in the skilled trades. To actually look at more trade opportunities by joining the New West Partnership Premier. My bill is full of, bill, is full of plans and details. It will be debated at 3 o'clock. Why don't you join me? Pass it, accelerate it, and let's get people back to work and restore hope in our great province. Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think we're going to stay on the plan that actually is creating jobs, Mr. Speaker. We've made, we've made enormous recovery since June 2009, and employment has risen by 95,000 jobs, more than 95,000 jobs just in this last year, Mr. Speaker. So obviously, the, ta the track that we're on that is leading to that job creation and is bringing business to the province, there's no doubt that we're in a transition, and I've said that many times over the, the past few weeks. We are in a transition. Many manufacturing companies are needing to invest in order to be able to compete globally, and that's why we're partnering with them, Mr. Speaker. One of the things that has surprised me about the Leader of the Opposition is that he has not expressed a willingness or an interest in partnering with businesses, in understanding that that kind of investment when we're competing yeah. with jurisdictions all around Answer. the world, that we have to put that kind of support and resource on the table. So we're going to continue to do that, Mr. Speaker, and I am absolutely positive that the recovery that we're seeing will continue. Thank you. Question, the leader of the third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Before I begin, on behalf of New Democrats, I want to uh, welcome and acknowledge Wayne Gates, the MPP elect, for the riding of Niagara Falls. And look forward to him taking his spot with our caucus. <laughs> Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Does the Premier agree that middle class families that make Ontario work are feeling financially stretched in tough times? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, uh, I absolutely do agree that uh, we have to be very cognizant of the burdens that uh, middle class people are feeling, Mr. Speaker. And the fact is that they are concerned about many things. One of the things that they're concerned about is retirement security, Mr. Speaker. One of the things that they're concerned about is that in their communities, people who are living on minimum wage haven't had certainty about where that minimum wage is going to go. Another thing that they're concerned about, Mr. Speaker, is that their children will have, children will have jobs. So, Mr. Speaker, we are 
absolutely concerned about the middle class and the plan that we put in place. And the six pillars of that plan, Mr. Speaker, are targeted directly at making sure that middle class people retain their jobs and that more people can find a middle class job, Mr. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, for months, the Premier has made it clear that she plans to move ahead with new unfair taxes, tolls and fees that will hit household budgets. Can the Premier tell families today how much more she'll be asking them to pay? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Again, underlying the question from the leader of the third party is, uh, is an assumption that people don't want more transit, Mr. Speaker, that people don't want investment in retirement security, that people don't want to make sure that there is a, a business climate that is going to allow them to find a job. Mr. Speaker, I have said, and I have said repeatedly, I am concerned about the burden that people in this province are carrying. I understand that that's something that we have to take very seriously, and when we bring in our budget, we will be paying very, very close attention to that. But, Mr. Speaker, that does not mean that the people of this province do not need investment in infrastructure and do not need investment and a structure within which to save for their retirement, Mr. Speaker. And I hope that the leader of the third party will support us on those issues, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think the Premier missed the premise of the question, which is what people can or cannot afford right now while they're being squeezed right out of the middle class. On election night, in fact, I heard the Premier dismiss the message that voters sent. She said she could ignore the voters and ignore the message she sent because, frankly, she's the Premier. One thing I heard loud and clear, knocking on doors in Niagara Falls and at kitchen tables and donut shops all over Ontario through the winter, was that families that make Ontario work feel like they are being squeezed right out of the middle class, and they cannot be asked to pay more yet again. Is the Premier going to listen, or will she continue to ignore them? Well, let me just say, first of all, Mr. Speaker, that I've been in those same donut shops, in those same kitchens, and I do not ignore the commentary from those people, Mr. Speaker, because they are us. There is no separation between us and them, Mr. Speaker. We are in this together, and if we do not make decisions for the long term in this legislature, if we do not make the investments that are necessary so that there will be jobs, so that there will be infrastructure in this province, then there will be no future for Ontario, Mr. Speaker. The member from Prince Edward Hastings come to order. New question, leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, next question is also for the Premier. I sent a letter to the Premier yesterday, and I made it clear that I will not support a budget that has new taxes or tolls for middle-class families. New Democrats are going to actually respect the people whose paychecks and jobs make Ontario work and focus on making their lives affordable, not squeezing them out of the middle class. Can the Premier tell hardworking Ontario families how much more the Liberal government is going to make them pay? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I got the letter. I got the letter from the leader of the third party, and I appreciate it. And I certainly will be responding, and I uh, I will be reaching out to both uh, leaders, and I would like to meet with them as we develop the budget, Mr. Speaker. But what was not in that letter, Mr. Speaker, was a single thing that the leader of the third party believes in. I have no idea, Mr. Speaker, if the leader of the third party supports indexing a minimum wage to inflation, Mr. Speaker. I have no idea whether the leader of the third party understands that those same people she's talking about are worried about retirement security, Mr. Speaker, for themselves and for their children. I have no idea if the leader of the third party understands and is, 
is interested in the fact that people are worried about how they're going to get to work and how they're going to get their kids home because of congestion, Mr. Speaker. So I look forward to meeting Answer. the leader of the third party, and I really look forward to uh, hearing from her what she believes in. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister of the Environment. That was a delayed reaction. Supplementary. Speaker, the Premier likes to talk about fairness, but families have been hit with the HST, climbing hydro bills, and the highest auto insurance rates in Canada. Well, the money they send to Queen's Park is allocated to gas plant cancellations, rising CEO salaries, bloated severance packages. I think it's time, Speaker, to show the middle class families who make Ontario work a little bit of respect. How much more is the Premier going to ask them to pay? I ask again, Speaker. Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, again, the leader of the third party has got a list of some very um, populist ideas, and, and Mr. Speaker, she she raised them last year when we talked about the budget, and uh, we found common ground. And so, uh, on auto insurance, for example, Mr. Speaker, in January, um, auto insurance rates dropped by 3.98 percent in the fourth quarter. So we've seen a reduction of 4.66 percent uh, on average since August. We're on track to meet our goal of an average 8 percent. Uh, reduction by August 2014. That's happening, Mr. Speaker. We are doing those things, and we, we had identified auto insurance as an area that, uh, that we needed to work on, Mr. Speaker. So we're working on those things. The leader of the third party does not have the corner on compassion for people who are burdened, Mr. Speaker. She does not have that. We are working to help people in their day-to-day -day lives, and we will continue to do that. But, Mr. Speaker, we also have a vision for how we should move ahead in this province. We also believe in something. We believe that yes, investing in people and partnering with business and investing in infrastructure and transit and making sure that people have those resources, that those things are important. Thank you. What does she believe in, Mr. Speaker? Final supplementary. Speaker. New Democrats are not going to support new taxes, tolls and fees that hit household budgets. We don't think that hitting families with yet another sales tax hike is going to actually grow our economy. And we don't agree with the Hudak Conservatives' plan for new private 407-style toll highways. The families that make Ontario work are being squeezed like never before, and our economy will not succeed if they're falling further and further behind. So, is the Premier ready to respect the people who sent us here, who voted in by-elections last week, and who are tired of being asked to pay more while others get all Question. the breaks? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, as I have said, I am very aware that people are feeling that, uh, that as the economy recovers that there are burdens on them and they are concerned about the future of the province, which is exactly why I think it's very important that at this moment in our history we have a plan that works with people in the province, that works with businesses in the province, that makes the investments that are necessary, Mr. Speaker, in order for us to have that aspirational future that I believe we all want, Mr. Speaker. So we're going to bring forward a budget that is fair, that is reasonable, Mr. Speaker, paying very close attention to the people who are, who are experiencing those concerns, Mr. Speaker, but at the same time, we are taking actions to help people. I would love to know, Mr. Speaker, why the leader of the third Answer. party will not commit to support our indexation of minimum wage yeah. to inflation, Mr. Speaker. That's an initiative that I would have thought the third party would have been very interested in. Any question? The member from Nicholson. Thank you very much. And good, uh, good morning, Speaker. 
My question is for the Premier. Let me share with you, Premier, what our caucus learned by visiting over 30 cities over the last couple of months, from Sarnia to Kenora, from Webequay to Oakville, from Timmins to Rockland, and dozens of communities in between, skyrocketing hydro Order. rates, high taxes, and crippling red tape were the top three issues. Speaker, our three biggest problems were created by this government, and they have absolutely no plan to change direction on any of those three issues. As a result, Ontario had 86 consecutive months with higher than the national average unemployment. Next Thursday, our leader, Tim Hudak, is bringing his Million Jobs Act to the floor of this legislature. Premier, will you support his plan to bring people back to work in Ontario? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Finance. Mr. Finance. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the question. Let's get some facts straight. Yeah. Ontario has had over 450,000 net. Order, please. I, uh, I, th I thought maybe one might be able to control themselves. Minister. Ontario has uh, been increasing jobs over the last number of years to the tune of 440,000 net new jobs, including the 300,000 that were lost during a recession that affected the global market, Mr. Speaker. We've taken initiatives. The members opposite are trying to recycle old plans that is going to bring us down in a downward spiral. They're looking at the initiatives that we've taken and they're trying to replicate some of what we've done, but they do it in a poor way. And you've been to the table way too late now because we're on a track to do even Answer. more. We we have in our plan another 100,000 more net new jobs coming forward because of the initiatives that we put in our budget. The member opposite should be supporting that, Mr. Speaker, and should be standing up for Ontario. Thank you. Well, thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Kellogg's, Heinz, Caterpillar, they've all left Ontario. Now, they're still making cereal, they're still making ketchup, they're still making earth moving equipment. They're just not making them in Ontario any longer. In fact, one million people woke up this morning in Ontario without a job. That's your facts, uh, Minister. You've given us the highest energy rates in North America, the highest payroll taxes in Canada. We're about to have the highest business taxes amongst the large province, uh, provinces in Canada, and it's this government that shut down the Red Tape Commission. Skyrocketing hydro, high taxes, crippling red tape. That's the legacy of the Liberal NDP coalition. coalition. Will you be supporting Tim Hudak's plan to put people back to work in the discussion next Thursday? Minister. Mr. Speaker, Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I still don't understand why the official opposition doesn't get the, the statistics from Statistics Canada that show 95,000 net new jobs created last year. And in fact, what the opposition is intent on is every job that's created in this province they seem to be against. So, 3,700 high-paying IT jobs that Cisco is bringing to this country, not some other country or jurisdiction around the world, in December. That party was against. And, Mr. Speaker, again, we've got evidence of job creation across this province in London, an announcement just last week where General Dynamics, the largest export contract in the history of this country, took place in London, Ontario, where they're going to be exporting. They have a contract for the next 14 years, which is going to guarantee the jobs for those 3,000 persons in London, Ontario. Mr. Speaker, the Eastern Ontario Development Fund, the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund together have created and retained more than 22,000 jobs, and this Answer. party opposite, Mr. Speaker, voted against that important measure. Mr. Speaker, I don't understand what their jobs plan is because, to me, it seems like it's jobs destruction. Thank you. Your question, the member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. For families across Ontario, it seems like the Liberal government just doesn't seem interested in the change that Ontario needs. Minister of the Environment will the come to order. The government is bringing down costs for auto insurance companies, but drivers tell us their bills are still climbing. The government promised to have the, the financial member, accountability member office up and running by the end of 2013 to protect taxpayers, but Christmas came and went, and no one's been hired. The Premier claims she's offering change. 
Why does it look like more of the same? I think Premier. Government House Leader. Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a little disappointed in the member. Uh, the Financial Accountability Officer is a, an officer of this House. There is a panel that is in place, which is, uh, my understanding, interviewing uh, individuals to take over that position. A member of her own party is on it, and to stand up here, Mr. Speaker, and try to mis be mischievous to say somehow we're dragging our feet on a process which involves the entire legislature, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, is quite frankly beneath her, and I'm very, very surprised that she would uh, raise this question. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Premier, families hear promises from this government, but Liberals seem unwilling or unable to deliver results. Despite promises to reduce auto insurance rates by 15 per cent, families still have not seen relief. The government seems more interested in playing the numbers than in reducing the rates. While families are being told they have to make sacrifices, they see yet another public sector CEO collecting more money in a severance package than they will make in a decade. And the government insists with a straight face that a hard cap at twice the premier's salary is absolutely impossible. The Financial Accountability Office, which was supposed to be up and running last year, remains vacant. Does the premier think that that is real change? Mr. Speaker, uh, again, I mean, this is, this is uh, as I say, beneath the honourable member. She knows exactly the process that is in place. We have a representative from each party. This is an officer of the legislature, Mr. Speaker, not an officer of the government, an officer of the legislature. It's in the hands of a committee of the legislature of which her party has a representative on it. Mr. Speaker, my understanding is that they are in the process of reviewing candidates. They will be conducting interviews, and they will come forward with a recommendation which will be considered by this legislature. That was what was envisioned in the legislation which was presented to this House, which her party supported, Mr. Speaker. And again, as I say, I think it's beneath her to try to sow mischief as she is today, Mr. Speaker. We look forward to a financial accountability officer as prescribed in the legislation which was brought forward to this legislature and supported by her and her party. Question to the member from Ottawa, Orleans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, our government wanted to ensure that going forward, the minimum wage will be set in a way that is both fair for workers and predictable for businesses. That's why we established the Minimum Wage Advisory Panel. This panel was comprised of representatives from business, labour, poverty advocates and youth. The panel travelled the province, speaking to and hearing from businesses, both large and small, community groups and everyday Ontarians. They then developed a consensus report based on the feedback it received from the outreach with Ontarians, and recently the chair of the panel provided his report with recommendations to the government. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, could you speak about what the panel recommended on this very important issue to all Ontarians? Thank you, Minister of Labour. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I, I thank the member from Ottawa Orleans for a very important question. Speaker, as you may recall, last June uh, the government uh, created a uh, independent advisory panel to look into the issue of minimum wage. Uh, the panel was uh, led by an uh, independent chair, and he uh, was also accompanied by members from the business community, both from retail and tourism, uh, from uh, labor. Uh, anti-poverty groups and uh, youth representatives. Speaker, uh, uh, they have uh, provided to the government a consensus report with four recommendations. The recommendations being that the minimum wage be linked to the consumer price index and it be revised annually with a four months notice. Also, that there be a full review of the minimum, minimum wage every five years, Speaker, and also that there be an ongoing research program that be established. Premier, I'm very, uh, Speaker, I'm very proud to say that uh, the Premier announced that uh, the government will be raising minimum yes, wage to $11 an hour as of June 1st, and also we will be bringing legislation forward that will index any future increases to the Ontario's consumer price index. Thank you. Yeah. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and I would like to thank the Minister for his response. I'm glad that we are giving hardworking Ontarians an increase in the minimum wage now. It's only fair. I'm happy to see legislation coming forward to remove the ad hoc nature of pre previous in increases. This legislation will provide predictable, uh, predictability for business, especially our small businesses, allowing them to plan for increases so that they may remain competitive and create jobs. Now, I know there are still some constituents in my community of Ottawa Orleans who would like the government to increase the minimum wage, 
by 40 percent to $14 an hour. And others have said that there should be no increase whatsoever. But it's, it's important that we take care to ensure that people's wages and businesses stay competitive. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you speak to what we are doing to ensure that the changes we Question. make are fair for workers and businesses alike? Yeah. Thank, you, Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, we are setting a fair minimum wage in Ontario. Fair for Ontarians that work on minimum wage and predictable for businesses that create jobs in our economy. We're using an objective and balanced way of determining minimum wage to $11 an hour and also tying any future increases on an annual basis to the cost of living. Therefore, Speaker, what we're suggesting is that we're taking politics out of how minimum wage is determined. Now, Speaker, it's regretful the official opposition does not support any increases to minimum wage. They did not raise minimum wage the eight years that they were in government, and of course, they don't support any minimum wage. But, Speaker, what has been surprising is how the NDP, the third party, has no position on minimum wage, Speaker. And that is, Speaker, is extremely shocking and surprising because people want to know where does the NDP speak, stand on increasing minimum wage. Do they support indexing minimum wage to cost of living? Thank you. It is shocking that this party has no position Thank whatsoever. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from the Thank you so very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of energy. I find myself asking where to start. They blew $1 billion on cancelled gas plants. They admitted to a 42 per cent hike in the hydro bills, announced more costly wind turbines, played postal code politics during the blackout, mismanaged the OPG according to the auditor, mishandled a propane shortage, and the Ombudsman is now investigating Hydro One. These are the facts. Enough is enough. When will this government admit that their energy strategy has failed Ontarians? Mr. Speaker, she covered a lot, and I'm going to try to cover several of those items. You know, people in this province have a choice, okay? They have a choice between the PC approach where their energy policy just doesn't add up. They claim they want to lower rates, but they have confirmed they will spend $15 billion on new nuclear energy that the province does not need. That will lead to major price increases, Mr. Speaker. They said first, order cancel existing fit contracts, and then their leader reversed course and said they wouldn't. And now Tory MPPs leave the impression they would cancel existing wind contracts. No. Their white paper on energy said they would create a special industrial rate. The only way they can do that is by shifting the burden onto uh, individual consumers. That's right. Terrible. We have a number of significant programs to help families with their energy bills, including the Ontario Clean Energy Benefit, Energy and Property Tax Credit, and Northern Ontario Energy Credit, which that Thank group you. and that party voted against. Thank you. Senior, please. Supplementary. Yeah, uh, speaker, while the Minister of Energy was playing hide and go seek uh, over the course of the last few months, I travelled to close to 30 ridings across Ontario to talk to families about hydro. Um, during doing the Minister's homework for him, this is what I found out, particularly about Hydro One. Seniors are spending more on their hydro bills than they are receiving in their OAS. Small businesses are closing under the threat of high bills and disconnection notices because of Hydro One. Families have lost thousands of dollars because of an incompetent billing scheme. This government has turned Hydro One into public enemy number one. A long time ago, when this minister was the mayor of Ottawa, he took decisive action against the Ottawa Housing Corporation because they failed the consumer, they failed the taxpayer. Now we see the Hydro One CEO Question. doing the same thing. What has changed? What has changed you? And will you take decisive action? Thank you, Minister. I'm uh, pleased that the critic raised the question of uh, the Hydro One issue. Mr. Speaker, Hydro One has 1.3 million customers, and a number of those customers have experienced unacceptable levels of inconvenience as a result of a new billing system. Prior to the Ombudsman's review, the CEO of Hydro One publicly apologized to the affected customers and has been working diligently to ensure all outstanding issues are corrected. 
And while Hydro One is an independent Crown Corporation, Mr. Speaker, our government shares in that apology. I have written to the Ombudsman and pledged the full cooperation of my office and the Ministry of Energy. Hydro One continues to work tirelessly on this issue, and refunds and credits are being offered for errors, and all interest and yes, charges have been waived, Mr. Speaker. Your question, the member from London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Last Wednesday, London's manufacturing sector took yet another hit with the announcement that Ontario-based Invicare, Invicare Corp was shutting do its doors to its long-term care beds plant and cutting 70 workers. The 70 workers laid off at Invicare join a long list of plant closures in southwestern Ontario. 740 workers laid off at Heinz in Leamington, 500 laid off at Kellogg's in London, and 100 laid off at Worthington Cylinders in Tilbury. Premier, when is this government going to get serious about creating and preserving good-paying manufacturing jobs that are the lifeblood of the southwestern economy. Thank you, Premier. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Sir. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a, a very important question, and I appreciate the member opposite asking it. And I want to start by saying, of course, whenever there's a closure or a notice of layoffs, that our first concern as a government is to those employees and their families to make sure that we do everything possible to uh, help them, assist them uh, under those difficult circumstances, and then also hopefully uh, get them that next job. And if it requires retraining, we uh, are also in a position to provide that kind of support as well. It's very important. With regards to London and more generally the, uh, the uh, southwestern Ontario region, uh, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, we were very pleased, I think the member, member opposite as well, last week the announcement of a $10 billion export contract from General Dynamics uh, in London, which is going to protect and preserve about 3,000 jobs. Wow, uh, that's, that's a contract huge. over 14 years, uh, Mr. Speaker, and so it's the kind of stability that that particular sector uh, uh, expects and, and enjoys. And, so, and I'll be speaking in the supplementary if I have the opportunity, but about some other investments as well. Supplementary, the member from um, London West. West. <laughs> Thank you. Um, speaker, the fact is that 300,000 manufacturing jobs have been lost while this government has been sitting on their hands, and southwestern Ontario has been hardest hit by those job losses. Speaker, a job strategy requires more than good labour adjustment practices and hoping that the feds hand out money. It should include initiatives like a job creation tax credit, something New Democrats have long called for, but this government refuses to act. When is this government going to move on initiatives such as the job creation tax credit to begin to make up for the 300,000 good-paying jobs that have been lost under their watch? Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I certainly hope the NDP don't follow the lead of the progressive conservatives when they begin to talk down this province yeah, in terms of yeah. our hard-working employees, our manufacturing sector, That's which has done so well. And they'll acknowledge as well, for example, in the auto sector, more than 12,500 new jobs created since the bottom of the recession. Uh, also, I was in London just a couple of weeks ago, with, uh, actually with uh, the Minister of Health, making a tremendous announcement with uh, Natra, which is a uh, chocolate company based in Europe. It shows London as its North American headquarters. Wow. It actually doesn't have a presence really? in this continent. It chose London, so Ontario, because of the opportunities that are provided there. And I know the member opposite also understands that the unemployment rate, which was unacceptably high in London, fortunately, we're seeing it come down. It was almost 9 percent roughly a year ago. It's now down uh, uh, significantly from that, that part. That doesn't mean that our work is done. And that's why important measures like the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund, which has created and retained more than, I think, it, we're up to about 8,000 jobs yeah. since its creation Answer. about a year and a half ago, are so important. Important for our economy and for our workers. Your question, the member from Oldsville. Thank you, there, Santa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture, and Sport. Minister, like the majority of Ontarians, I've been cheering on the other Ontarians from our own backyard who are proudly representing our great country of Canada and this great province at the Olympics in Sochi. My own riding of Oldsville serves as a great hub for athletes like Brianne Jenna and John Tavares. But to compete with the best in the world, it takes years of dedication, 
of training and support of all kinds to help our athletes reach events like the Olympics. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, would he please share with this House what our government is doing to support those high-performance athletes, as well as the current, future Olympians and Paralympians? Thank you, Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, thank you, Speaker, and thank you very much for the question from, uh, from my, my colleague in Oakville. Uh, speaker, my ministry's Quads Kogo is a program that's an excellent example of our government's commitment to our high-performance athletes and para athletes. Some of the main objectives of the program are to help athletes continue their pursuit of athletic excellence at the highest levels of national and international competition, encourage athletes to stay in Ontario to live and receive the training, enable athletes to successfully pursue excellence in sport while fulfilling their educational goal, and increase athletes' access to high-performance coaching. Speaker, since it was established in 2006, in seven years, our government has provided Ontario athletes and coaches with more than 80 million in sport. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for that wonderful response. I'm sure we can all agree that our athletes and para-athletes not only serve as ambassadors in sport, but as leaders, as performers, and as an inspiration to us all here back home. As it turns out, Team Canada this year is the largest we've ever had for a Winter Olympics. It's represented by more Ontarians than any other province in this great country. 64 athletes, 11 coaches from Ontario will be on Team Canada in the hopes of winning gold in their respective sports. With so many of our athletes competing at Sochi, Mr. Speaker, again, through you to the Minister, could he please tell us what our government is doing to specifically support Ontario's sports sector? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Our government is pleased to support our athletes as they pursue athletic excellence. We are proud to support them at events like the Winter Olympics in Sochi. I would like to once again congratulate the strong contingent of Ontario athletes on Team Canada, who will make our province proud as they compete for gold. Speaker, these Ontarians and Canadians serve as an inspiration to us all, past, present and future athletes and parlour athletes, with their stories and performances only reinforce the importance of developing community role models and to promote an active, healthy lifestyle. Speaker, this is why in 2013 and to 2014, Answer. our government has provided over 23 million to our sport partners to achieve these goals. Thank, thank you, you Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Question the member from Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Speaker. My question this morning is to the Premier. In the 12 months since your win for a Liberal NDP coalition came to power, Ontario has lost an additional 30,000 vital manufacturing jobs. Dozens of plants across our province have announced layoffs or outright closure since your Liberal coronation. Premier, southwestern Ontario has been especially hard hit with recent plant closing announced at Invacare London, that was 70 jobs, Hines Leamington, 740 jobs, Kellogg's London, 500 jobs, Worthington Cylinders Tilbury, 100 jobs, Westcast Industries Strathroy, 40 jobs, Imperial Oil Lubricant Sarnia, 60 jobs, Ethel Corporation Corona, 30 jobs. Premier, why are so many factories closing under your watch? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, and uh, I know the member opposite has his list, so I'll go through my list and I'll start in Dunville with Original Foods. And I was actually at the opening of that uh, new company where they moved here from Quebec, 150 jobs created just last fall. Arbo Tool in London, which I know uh, just outside of London, I know the uh, member opposite knows well, was our first recipient of the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund. 14 jobs. Armstrong Milling, Milling in Hagersville, 10 jobs. The Centre Line in Windsor, 31 jobs. Conestoga Meats uh, in Kitch outside of Kitchener and Breslau, 100 jobs there, Mr. Speaker. Dash Canada, 10 jobs. Jerome's Manufacturing, another 12. Elmira Pet Products in Elmira. 
146 jobs protected and many more created, Mr. Uh, Speaker. And the list goes on and on from Tilsonburg to Cambridge, Wallaceburg, Guelph, St. Catharines. It's unfortunate that the party opposite did not support us in creating a permanent fund for southwestern Ontario to create those exact manufacturing jobs that the member opposite seems to be so concerned about. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker. Uh, back to the Premier. Premier, on January 22nd, I wrote to you about the closure of Westcast in Strathroy. The reason for this closure is due to the high price of electricity, coupled with Ontario's outdated labour policies and outdated apprenticeship ratios. In fact, Westcast CEO wrote to me on January 7th and said, and I quote, if electricity rates do not become more affordable, Ontario risks losing important investments from companies like Westcast. Premier, your care careless approach has helped push Ontario's manufacturing sector into crisis. 30,000 manufacturing jobs have been lost since you've become Premier of this province. Only Tim Hudak and the Ontario PCs have put forward a jobs plan to help the thousands of people who are unemployed Question. in Ontario today. Premier, I ask again, how come so many manufacturing plants are closing under your watch, and why are you and NDP leader Andrew Horvath so determined to lead the race Thank to the you. bottom? Please. Please it, please. Please it, please. Thank you. Minister? Well, Mr. Speaker, it's pretty rich coming from this party opposite that hasn't supported, really hasn't supported any of our jobs plans or efforts over the past few years. If they had, if they had had their way, Mr. Speaker, back when the province supported the auto industry in 2009, which they did not support, we wouldn't even have an auto industry. It would have left to the United States or to Mexico. Fortunately, we've created 12,500 new jobs in, in the auto sector alone, Mr. Speaker, and they're not even listening to their own party in Ottawa when Jim Flaherty just a few weeks ago talked about the manufacturing sector in this province and said it was bouncing back, Mr. Speaker. And also we have RBC that came out with a report in December which indicated that they see significant recovery in the manufacturing sector in the two years ahead. It's going to help drive the recovery, of course, with the Canadian dollar coming down. That's going to help as well. So we're making great strides. I don't know why the member opposite and his party continues to talk down this economy. The hard work Working Ontario yes, workers that are working in the manufacturing sector and the 700,000 people that I'm very proud of that contribute to manufacturing in this province, Mr. Speaker. Another question? Leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. After months and months of constant pressure on the Liberal government from horse people, from the Fort Erie Council and the NDP, the government finally listened and promised funding so that the Fort Erie racetrack can have live racing this coming season. However, one-time funding for this year alone is not a solution for the hundreds of families that depend on the Fort Erie racetrack. Will the Premier commit to reinstating the slots at racetrack's partnership and ensure that Fort Erie has a long and bright future? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, it was um, it was gratifying when the leader of the third party began questioning about Fort Erie and horse racing when the by-election was on the horizon, Mr. Speaker. The fact is, we'd been working on this plan. We'd been working to restore horse racing, Mr. Speaker, across the province. We'd had we had the panel in place. We had their recommendations, Mr. Speaker. I was determined to provide an opportunity for Fort Erie and the other tracks in the province to have. Have a sustainable future. Yep. Now, the leader of the third party is asking whether we will bring back a non-accountable, inefficient plan, Mr. Speaker, program. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. We have a strategy, Mr. Speaker. We have invest. We have. Uh, we've committed to investing 400 million dollars, Mr. Speaker, over the next five years, and we will continue to work yes, with sir. the industry to make sure that they have a sustainable future, as we worked with Fort Erie by election or not, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Well, Speaker, like it or not, this government waited until a few days before a provincial by-election to announce funding for Fort Erie. I don't recall that they've announced any other funding, Speaker. The NDP stood shoulder to shoulder with the people of Fort Erie since day one, Speaker. It's unfortunate that the Premier didn't even know this. And we will 
continued Speaker to push the government for a long-term solution and not just by-election promises. Will the Premier do the right thing, Speaker? Reinstate the slots at racetracks partnership so that horse racing can continue at the Fort Erie track and sustain over a thousand jobs in the region for many, many years to come. Thank you, Premier. Much, Mr. Speaker, we're working towards a five-year plan. We're working towards a five-year plan, and that is, I think the people at Fort Erie know that. And Mr. Speaker, the leader of the third party should know that when I went, met with the Fort Erie folks at a round table, Mr. Speaker, there were horse people in the lobby of that building urging us to make an announcement sooner rather than later because they were making business decisions. Now, the leader of the third party may not know that, and because she has chosen to link this to the by-election, that's her prerogative. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, we were meeting with the folks in Fort Erie before there was a question raised in this House. We are working towards a long-term plan, and restoring horse racing in this province, Mr. Speaker, is something I committed to, and I have delivered on that, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Any questions? The member from Brampton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. Since 2008, over 65 municipalities have passed resolutions calling on the government to legislate against strategic lawsuits. Our government heard those concerns, and on June 4, 2013, the Attorney General introduced Bill 83, a proposal for the protection of public participation. It passed first reading. This is an important bill that assists with an increase of access to justice for all Ontarians. Mr. Speaker, could the Attorney General please tell the House about the protection of public participation? Thank you. Attorney General. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. And let me first of all say how great it is to be back here to discuss the issues of the day in an open and free democratic fashion. And the member is quite, uh, quite correct, you know, that. Uh, this question is very timely because this afternoon we will continue second uh, reading debate on Bill 83. Second and third and reading. we as a government have worked very hard to develop a proposal that balances the protection of the public, participation and freedom of expression with the protection of reputation and economic interest. And we all know that if this bill is passed, it would protect citizens by allowing courts to quickly identify and deal with these strategic lawsuits, including a fast-track process which re uh, requires that a request to dismiss must be heard by the courts within 60 days. Here, here. That is good for the system. It's yeah. good for all parties concerned, Speaker. And that's why I urge everyone here to support Bill 83. Here. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's good to hear of our government's commitment in balancing the protection of public participation while also considering the protection of reputation and economic interest. This pro provides a made in Ontario solution based on the, uh, the consensus recommendation of an expert uh, advisory panel and extensive stakeholder consultations. Mr. Speaker, in addition to assisting with the early identification of strategic lawsuits, could the Attorney General please inform this House of other ways in which the bill assists in protecting public participation? Thank you. Question. Attorney General. I think we all recognize, Good Speaker, question. that reputation is very important to each and every one of us, and we've worked very hard to develop a proposal that balances the interest of the defendants and the plaintiffs in these defamation suits. The protection of public participation and the freedom of expression against the protection of reputation and economic interest. Speaker, the proposed legal test for identifying strategic suits is carefully balanced to ensure that lawsuits that seriously harm reputation, business or personal interests of others can continue. On the other hand, causes with no merit or with merely technical merit but without evidence of substantial harm would be dismissed within that 60-day period. The government's continued support of the legislation such as this particular bill ensures that all parties' interests will be considered in the civil process, and I hope that this bill passes with the unanimous consent of this House as soon as possible. Thank Speaker. you. Your question? A member from Burlington. Premier, since your party came to office, the province's manufacturing sector has lost over 330,000 manufacturing jobs. Yep. That's a city the size of London, waking up with no jobs, few prospects, and losing hope. Since you became Premier, roughly 40 companies have announced Ontario's closure. There's Rock 10 in my riding of Burlington, Kraft and Oakville. Novartis in Mississauga, Aco in Brampton, Westcast in Strathroy, Exxon Mobile in Belleville, Sandvik in North Bay. Sadly, the list of closures goes on and on. 
Premier, most new employees get three months probation. You've had a year. When will you make jobs a priority? Good question. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the uh, question from the member opposite. I have to say I still don't understand why you didn't support the Cisco investment in this province, which is creating 3,700 uh, high-tech, good, good jobs over the next uh, 10 years. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, our manufacturing sector, we've resulted since the bottom of the recession. We've actually created 25,000 jobs in the manufacturing sector across this province, and many of them, of course, are in the part of the province that the uh, member opposite represents. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you, in terms of the what isn't in their jobs plan, curiously, but obviously is a preoccupation of the party opposite, is their right to work plan, which quite, quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, is the centerpiece of their jobs plan. But it's going to be a right to work for less. It's going to be it's a scheme that Answer. will lower wages and less benefits for all workers in Ontario. And Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to talk more about that in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. So I'm curious, Minister, how are we supposed to judge your numbers? It's not 3,100, it's 1,700 for Cisco, but nevertheless, I'll give you this. Liberal economics. Consistent in driving businesses out of Ontario, and it's not hard to figure out why. Ontario has the highest rates in North America. Small and medium businesses are drowning in red tape. We've had the highest WSIB rates in the country, which cripples businesses' ability to hire. Higher bottom line costs, more bureaucratic headaches. Not exactly a winning economic strategy. You need to step up your game or step aside. Here, here, what here, are you here. going to show the people of Ontario a real job plan? Here, here. Good job, here, here. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, first of all, it is 3,700 new jobs by Cisco, and the member opposite needs to get her facts straight. Mr. Speaker, also, in terms of the right to work for less plan, it's not something that we're obviously preoccupied because the, the party opposite is advocating. Many of their own members are very concerned about its potential impact. They know that it's a job killer, it's going to drive down wages, and it's going to hurt job creation. So I know they're trying to distract the public by focusing on this alleged million jobs plan, but the centerpiece of that is the right-to-work legislation, the Wisconsin-like legislation that they want to—this uh, to this policy, which we know is so extreme that even the member opposite's own party is trying to seek some clarity and asking their leader to come out clean as to what kind of damage he's going to do to our economy through this right-to-work legislation. Eleven PC candidates in Northern Ontario are concerned. They're turning to us as well to make sure that this explosive policy file of the uh, PC party, that it doesn't see the light of day. The PC former PC candidate Thank Niagara you. Falls is on record as saying Thank you. Thank you. New question. <laughs> Member Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Last week, Avery Edison, a trans woman, was held at Maplehurst Correctional, a provincial men's facility. Being confined in a jail for men, Ms. Edison's health and safety were put at dire risk. In Ontario, we have Toby's Law, where gender identity and gender expression are protected under the Ontario Human Rights Code. Can the minister explain why Toby's Law is not being respected? Thank you. Minister of Community Safety and Corrections. Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for this uh, excellent question. Yes, this uh, issue was brought up to, uh, to my attention. And uh, so it uh, it's was of concern to me too. So I think that it's, uh, the, the problem was, uh, was resolved. And we have uh, policy in place to uh, ensure that, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, that you know, the, the process is, is followed very closely. Ministry uh, officials uh, uh, conduct a screening process for every inmate that is admitted into a provincial custody. Part of that process is identifying the individual's sexual identity. An individual may self-identify as transgendered, or uh, the facility may be uh, notified by authority that the individual is transgendered. So correctional uh, officers take uh, self-identification into account, and in the supplementary— Thank you. I'll allow the uh, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, uh, last week I wrote to the minister urging an immediate investigation into Ms. Edison's confinement in a jail for men. Clearly, whatever policies are in place are not working. Everyone involved in this detention should be trained in how to treat trans people with dignity and respect. Such an incident must not reoccur. So I'm going to ask again, will the minister be launching an investigation into this matter? Thank you, Minister. Uh, I, uh, I would like to uh, ensure the uh, member from uh, the opposition that the, uh, that is not going to happen again, but unfortunately I, uh, I cannot uh, say that, but we will make sure that the, uh, an investigation, first of all, is uh, being conducted uh, when these things happen, and uh, the policy will be reviewed. And uh, to make sure that uh, you know everybody is treated as they should be, and an incident like uh, the one that happened does not uh, happen again. But uh, you know, the, of course, the uh, safety of individuals and those in correctional facility are Answer. taken very seriously, and we wanted to uh, treat uh, these uh, people with respect and dignity. And I'll I'll make sure that uh, you know we reinforce the uh, the, pro the procedure. Thank you. Thank you. The member from Kitchener Waterloo on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I rise on a point of order. Understanding order section 23, subsection I, imputes false or unavowed motives to another member. The House Leader earlier today accused my question of being mischievous. In fact, the budget of 2013 passed in May. The interviews are not happening. I, uh, I look for the day when none of us are mischievous. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.